Idlewild Arts respectfully acknowledges the Kawishpa Kawiakna, also known as Kawia Band of Indians, and all nine sovereign bands of Kawia people who have stewarded this land throughout the generations and continue to steward this land for all future generations. Idlewild Arts Foundation is proud to present One World, One Idlewild, the series, in conversation with Pamela Jordan. The series brings together thought leaders, creatives, influencers, and changemakers, highlighting the work of citizen artists whose careers and lives have been shaped by the transformative power of art. From Idlewild Arts Foundation in Idlewild, California, I'm Pamela Jordan with One World, One Idlewild, the series. Today, I'm speaking with Dr. Stephen Levine, former president of California Institute of the Arts. Stephen, it's my absolute pleasure to speak with you today. It is great to see you again. <laughs> I wish you were up there at Idlewild. Oh, it's beautiful here right now with the, the, the snow. We've had a few days of snow and the snow-capped mountains. It's just gorgeous. And today it's sunny. <laughs> Well, I want to congratulate you on uh, on your book, Stephen D. Levine, Failure is What It's All About, A Life Devoted to Leadership in the Arts. And we're going to dig into that a little bit today. I've been fascinated reading it. Um, but let's back up a little bit. I've been looking at looking over your very distinguished career, and there are no signs of you really slowing down since you retired from Cal Arts in 2017. But as I look back over the years, I see that you were assistant professor of English and American literature at the University of Michigan for seven years, I believe. Uh, you served as assistant and then associate director of arts and humanities at Rockefeller Foundation for seven years, I believe. But it's at CalArts where you've had your longest tenure. You served as president at CalArts for 29 years. What drew you to CalArts and compelled you to stay so long? <laughs> it's a nice question. Thank you. Um, initially, it was I, I dealt with a lot of artists while, while I was at the Rockefeller Foundation in New York, and CalArts just kept coming up, either as alumni, people like Jim Lapine, who was Stephen Sondheim's collaborator in all those great musicals, or Bill Irwin, the mime. Just they, it just kept appearing. Um, and then I'd meet other people like Laurie Anderson, who had been faculty there. Uh, and so I was curious, but what really sold me is when we went out to look and we took one step in the door um, and it was like this explosion of compressed energy. Um, I had taught at the University of Michigan and you'd find students sitting around campus and maybe they're reading a book or maybe they're just sitting around. Uh, this was clearly a place where no one just sat around, uh, <laughs> that carts of equipment would race by, um, People you'd hear actors rehearsing in the background, just in any open space. And it was that energy that uh, my wife and I thought we were going to have to talk it over. We were going to make this move. And after exposure to that energy, we just realized we didn't even have to discuss it. This was, this was it. That's wonderful. I think, especially in independent schools where I've spent my career, we always talk about a fit. You have to get onto that campus. You have to walk into that building and you know it when you get there. And that's for the students as well as everybody who really devotes their life, their, their time, their career to serving those students. It's just, it's very compelling. What well, Jorn Jakob Rover wrote your biography and released it in a book titled Failure is What It's All About, A Life Devoted to Leadership in the Arts. Now, many people would devote their time in retirement to, to write their memoirs, but you allowed Joran to capture your life story. Did you feel that he would capture your story in a way that you wouldn't if you wrote your autobiography? He certainly did. Um, I didn't want a biography at all. Uh, it was really <laughs> my wife who thought after 29 years, we should leave a record of what was accomplished at CalArts. So I went into this thinking, what we're doing is not, not a biography, we're doing um, uh, the mechanics and the, what, what happened in those years. Uh, but Yorn was, is someone who's interested in your values and how you got to be who you are. And so he turned it into something much broader and I think ultimately more interesting than what I would have generated myself. And he asked a kind of question that got me asking questions. Um, in a way, he gave me my parents back again by asking questions about them. Um, 
in some ways the book is was a revelation to me. <laughs> it was it. Uh, it's interesting to hear you say that because I think that that is one of the most compelling aspects of the book is that it goes uh, it goes certainly deep into your career, but deep into your past. And I think as a leader, people really don't see that part of you, no matter how social a person may be, or if you think, you know, you really are about leading your institution. And uh, that really just resonated with me uh, in particular, as I think about how separate my personal life is from my professional life. And um, I, I love that he brought that out in the book. Um, you've said that, you know, to, uh, to that regard, you've, you've said that you feel outwardly that your life has been very successful, but inwardly there's a hole and Yorn gave you the opportunity to sew the two halves together. That couldn't have been easy for you to go there. Why did you uh, let down your guard? Uh, Yorn and I spoke for about six hours a day for a month. Hmm. And he'd come each time with a prepared set of questions. He'd done his own research. He found out when my grandparents passed through Ellis Island, things we didn't know. Um, and so he really forced it and he wouldn't let the questions go. Um, and yes, uh, well, this is a little biography. Uh, my mother uh, was a music school graduate, won competitions as a pianist, but was shy. Uh, didn't have any money and was never able to have the career she prepared to have and really wanted and was a very unhappy woman as a result. As a, as a kid, I thought it was my job to cheer her up uh, and I couldn't. And so I sort of withdrew in self-defense against her pain and it really became my way of going through life, sort of assuming that if you expose yourself that's full of pain, that you just put up a, a good shield and, and you go forward. And it served me well. And, and in a way, I used to say part of the fun of Kellogg's is I felt like I was wearing this shiny armor and you didn't, you didn't have to explain who you were. You just, the fact that you were the president already carried a message. Um, I could see especially, I had these relationships with people, but too often they were instrumental. You were, you were friends because you needed to be friends because you needed to ask them for money or you needed to work with them. Um, and I could see my wife had a whole different kind of relationships with people that were much deeper and more resonant. Mine was basically gratitude. <laughs> and I, um, and as, I, as we went through my biography, I realized the extent to which I had been exposed to all these wonderful people in my life and still kept this distance learned from them, but with rare exceptions, didn't form the kind of deep human bond that you really want to have. And so I saw my retirement, uh, it was a chance um, to have a whole different kind of relationship. Uh, and it's been interesting. Uh, there's a couple of trustees uh, from CalArts um, who I always liked, but I was always aware when I was with them that I had to perform because my job was to get them to care about us and to see them not with, with CalArts and not even talk about CalArts, <laughs> it's hard to resist. Uh, they became actual, becoming actual friends and, uh, and really Jorn helped me see that whole process and, uh, and um, I think prepared me for this next phase of my life. <laughs> You, that's so interesting. It, it it made me think about a book I read many years ago now. I believe the title is The Third Chapter, Life Between 50 and 75. What you're saying reminds me of that. I remember in reading it, it was a sense of, you know, from interviewing all of these people who were between the ages of 50 and 75, a sense of going home, a sense of something that occurred in their youth that in later years they returned to. So it's so powerful what you what you're saying that somehow there's a there's a returning to a, a return to that youth or or whenever you sort of compartmentalize what was in your youth that you you felt you needed to let go in order to move on. No, and in a way, uh, this living our life on the internet during this this pandemic, uh, there are friends from high school that I'm now in touch with, uh, maybe once a month. 
uh, who were my best friends then, but they weren't part of my life going forward. Um, and now they're part of my life in a way. And one of the things I'm aware of is that I lost all these years when I could have been in connection with them and wasn't. Right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shift over to leadership. This is something that I am certainly very interested in. I've heard you talk about your experience at CalArts following the Northridge earthquake in 1994. I was reminded of uh, 9-11 uh, when I was at my previous school, which was located in, uh, just n uh, near downtown Chicago. And public transportation and all of the roadways were shut down early in the day because the government really didn't know exactly what was going on. And it was so difficult to get to my school and I was desperate to get to my school uh, to see you know, the students who were already there. Um, and as I understand it, when the Northridge earthquake occurred, you were actually on vacation with your wife. How difficult was it for you to get to the school and what did you find when you got there? It's a, it's a nice story. We were up in Mendocino celebrating her birthday uh, in a place we love and we went in to a bookstore to buy the Sunday Times and uh, heard someone saying, um, uh, I can't get a line through to Los Angeles on the telephone. And someone else said, well, whenever there's a disaster, you can't get through on the telephone. And that was the first we heard of it. We called Janet's mother um, uh, who said, oh, it's awful. But Janet's mother often thought things were awful. So I didn't, again, I didn't take it very seriously. Uh, we flew back, we had to go to Santa Barbara. We couldn't fly into Los Angeles, the airports were closed. Uh, my, my wonderful secretary for the whole time I was there, Judy McGinnis came and picked, picked us up and drove us to our home, which had survived all right. Uh, and we drove out to campus and, um, the first thing you're aware of is there was no electricity any longer and our building has a lot of floors that are below ground. And so it was totally dark. And you were aware that anything that could have fallen down, including whole banks of computers had fallen down, but we, we didn't know how bad the damage was. Uh, and then over the next couple of days, we realized we'd lost the use of our, all our educational facilities. Um, and it was, we were in the midst of registration uh, for the second semester. So the students had returned? They, the, students, they... the students had returned. Oh. And luckily the dorms had survived. Uh, and a lot of students, the graduate students live in the neighborhood. Um, and I remember the, the head of ed, uh, admissions drove her mobile home to campus because she could use the battery from the mobile home and the generators from the mobile to run the computers so she could register people. Um, and then we had to face, how are we gonna have a semester when we have no, no place to teach any longer? Uh, at, at first I was just paralyzed. Uh, there, there isn't a book on what you do when you've lost everything. And then, um, I realized, I think the first realization is we're going to need space. There's, there's no way to run a school if there was no place to put people. And I think it was probably the head of advancement said, well, we should set up some tents. We can get party tents and that'll buy us some time to find space. And so we put up 12 party tents and each of the schools got a party tent of their own. Luckily it wasn't raining. Uh, and each of the administrative units got a party tent. Um, and then I just asked uh, basically every administrator to go out and rent everything they could find. Don't even ask what it's for. Just in, in a day or two, it's all gonna be gone because everybody's gonna have damage. So just rent anything you see and we'll figure out afterward what to do with it. Um, and then each day at the end of the day, this may be more answer than you wanted. I'm sorry. No, I, 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 I'm mesmerized. I love it. I love hearing about it. Each day at the end of the day, our, our big fear, and I, I'm sure it's like colleges felt and, and, and schools have felt this year, that if the, if the students didn't enroll, um, we would lose not only whatever it was going to cost to rebuild the facility, and we had no idea what that was going to be, but, if, but with, if we lost the entire semester's tuition um, and faculty were already on contract, um, we probably couldn't survive. 
Uh, we didn't we didn't have a big endowment at that point. Um, and so just we just had to go on. And each day at the end of the day, I would meet all the students outside the building because you couldn't go in. And I just tell them what we acquired that day and who was going to go where. And meanwhile, the and this is about the wonderful faculty that schools like yours and colleges like CalArts have. Um, each, each school picked their most powerful speaker, lecturer, basically. There's very little lecturing at CalArts, mm -hmm. but there wasn't much you could do in a party tent besides teach by talking. Um, so each one put their best teacher uh, to lead everyone in the school in a class while the rest of the faculty figured out how, the, how they were gonna pr provide their semester. Um, and again, I, I, I expect just like Idlewild, the, the, um, the loyalty of the faculty, the students, they were determined that they were gonna deliver somehow, uh, that that's what they were there for. And I think we've seen that all over the country as faculty have tried to deliver during the pandemic in, in ways they never imagined. I, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, you know, I think about when when everyone was pushed, suddenly pushed online, pushed into distance learning. And, um, you know, at, at Idlewild Arts also, we're very hands-on, especially, especially when you think of the arts. And uh, there's no doubt we could not have continued forward uh, without the Herculean effort of those teachers determined not just to educate the students, but to connect with them, to be that anchor for them, that everything was going to be okay. And in our, in our situation, you know, our students are spread out on five continents. They were, they were teaching, you know, getting up at three and four and five in the morning so that they could teach students and, you know, give private lessons at nine o'clock at night. It was just extraordinary. But, uh, um, and I think a crisis will, you know, cause people to rise to that and just to know that that who you are as a community, we end each one of our school gatherings where we say to the kids, remember who you are and what you stand for. And this community really rose to that as we've, if we've continued through the pandemic. No, and it was a wonderful feeling being, this isn't a nice metaphor, but it was like you were soldiers together in this war. Um, and I remember in my father's gener, my father was quite a lot older than one would assume, um, and his generation had fought in World War II. And for many of them, not my dad, who was a doctor, it was the greatest experience in their lives. Uh, and the experience was of comradeship, uh, not of the war, but of being with other people and your lives depending on it. And that's how it felt uh, to be working. And no one reasoned, this is my job description. Uh, I can't do this because I... Um, the, the building was immediately red tagged, you weren't allowed in, but the food service people knew that without electricity, the food that was in the freezers would spoil uh, in the next 24 hours. And so they broke the rules and they went in and they, they uh, got the food out of the refrigerator so we could start offering meals. And I said, how are you gonna offer meals? And they said, well, we've all worked for caterers in the past, we can cook on outdoor grills. Um, and they just did it. It didn't take have to direct them to do it. It was beautiful. It's a remarkable story of resilience. It really is. You're listening to One World, One Idlewild, the series. I'm Pamela Jordan. We'll be right back. Idlewild Arts Academy is an independent boarding arts high school whose mission is to change lives through the transformative power of art. Located just two hours inland from Los Angeles and San Diego, and one hour from Palm Springs, the school sits on 205 acres of forested land in the San Jacinto Mountains. Academy students receive a challenging college preparatory academic curriculum while engaging in pre-professional training in their chosen arts discipline. The school is also home to its world-renowned summer program that serves children starting at age five through adults age 95. Idlewild Arts believes that art is the greatest teacher of humanity and that the practice of creativity, no matter the ultimate expression, hones each individual's desire and ability to craft global change. To learn more, visit idlewildarts.org. Use code OneWorld2021 to receive a $50 discount to the 2021 summer program. Quantities are limited, restrictions apply. 
please consider supporting the students of Idlewild Arts and visit idlewildarts giving to make a gift today. If you're just joining us, today I'm speaking with Dr. Stephen Levine, former president of California Institute of the Arts. You know, I, one of the things I heard you say that just resonated with me uh, was that when you look back, or while you were in it even, you realized that you had been thinking too small. You know, that your community really rose the, from the board, the teachers, administrators, they really rose to meet that moment. And you realized that, that you had probably been thinking too small. Can you, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, when, when I arrived at CalArts in 88, uh, they'd had five years of deficit, had drawn down the little endowment they had. Uh, I remember what the treasurer at the Rockefeller Foundation said, don't go there. Remember his phrase was it shipped for voyage. He said, they're gonna go out of business, this is structural. And I believe then, and I still believe that if you're dealing with something that's great, there'll be a way to go on. It's not obvious, but there will be a way to do it. Uh, and so I went anyway, uh, but I was used to, I had had five years in which every hundred dollars was a decision because we were in deficit and it was how much you could reduce the deficit, not what, how much more you could spend. Uh, and we had finally gotten to a balanced budget. In fact, on New Year's Eve before the earthquake, my wife and I toasted the fact that CalArts was safe. Uh, that we'd, we'd gotten it out of this hole and we had some fresh leadership and it, everything was going to be fine. And then 17 days later, you realize you're never safe. It's just an illusion. Um, so, and, and then in the course of rebuilding, uh, we worked crews 24 hours a day, six days a week, because we figured if we weren't rebuilt by fall, gradually we discovered we had $40 million worth of damage. And at that point, maybe $10 million in, say, in reserve, and that was it. And I had no idea how we we're going to pay the $40 million. Uh, I'm glad I didn't know all at once it was going to add up to that. Um, uh, and I also knew if we didn't have campus, and it was one thing for students who are already there to stay, but to ask students to go to college to start a new year in a place without a campus was not going to work. Um, so we had to find a construction company that would agree without knowing how much damage there was that they would hire enough people to get this done no matter what. And it took all sorts of trustee influence because there were lots of work to do. There was lots of disaster in Los Angeles. Nobody really wanted this job. And someone made somebody else based on their past loyalties take on the work. And then he made his son, who was now running the company, actually <laughs> do it. Um, but we were wake, we, our project manager would sleep on campus at night. And if we did counter a problem, we would solve it. He'd phone me if it was up above a certain amount. And so we were making hundred thousand dollar decisions, $500,000 decisions based on a phone conversation in the middle of the night. And it was kind of liber. I mean, it was awful because again, we didn't know how we'd pay for it, but it was liberating to actually be able to take aggressive action. Um, and uh, this is now jumping ahead, but I think up up till then, um, a lot of faculty thought Calitz was just, it was too good to be true, too idealistic, couldn't possibly survive in the long run. I remember a student uh, faculty trustee saying, we should just spend down the little endowments that left have a good last couple of years and say goodbye, that the Bauhaus didn't last, Black Mountain College didn't last, there's no reason we should. And I said, um, you should have told me this before I came because <laughs> I I can't live that way. That's, that's not my, that's just not me. Um, well, after the Northridge earthquake, no one ever talked like that again. We realized that we were actually tough. Um, I think tough the way in good independent schools are tough. Yes. Uh, that you look like you're fragile sometimes, uh, but in fact, uh, you're used to coping with difficulty and finding a way to go forward. Um, and so that, that was really uh, a great lesson and in fact, we became much more aggressive in the years we once we paid off the money, <laughs> which we found a way to do. Um, 
fairly quickly, actually. And you had you had about six months to build back, right? If you were going to start the next school year going into your into your building, right? Yeah. Basically, wow. by the time we started the work, it was six months. It was eight months overall, but it took time to assess, to find a construction company to actually get to the point of rebuilding. It, it gave me the courage after that, that we could start new programs before we knew how we were going to fund them entirely. That, that we could build things that we didn't know how we we're going to, and I, I mean, within reason. <laughs> uh, um, so it, cha it changed you as a leader? It changed me utterly. Utterly, uh, it, it kind of goes back to the, the 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 story of the book. Failure is what it's all about. My mom, not having been able to have the career she prepared for, kind of gave up on life and was a very depressed person. Uh, and I, having failed to be able to cheer her up, lived with a kind of fear of failure. And suddenly, I was encountered. Uh, an impossible situation and we were successful. And it was like I got my, it was like graduating from myself uh, and arriving at a kind of settled, I don't know, adulthood, but something more stable and certain uh, going forward. It changed me utterly. Besides my wife and uh, originally going to CalArts, uh, I would say the best thing that ever happened to me was the Northridge earthquake. Mm. I, I tell my staff all the time in this pandemic, don't waste a good crisis. <laughs> you know, really confront those things that you, you we've known have always been there. Uh, and, and as you said, the way the teachers have responded, what the way everyone has responded, and we see who we are, the moral fiber of who we are, we can do more. And let's not waste this time to think about going back to what we were. What, what about your board? Did it change your, your, your board uh, in a noticeable way? That's a good question. I would say it changed my relationship to the board. Mm -hmm. um, I think initially, like many institutional leaders, I thought of the board as, well, their job is to help us raise the money. Um, but suddenly I needed expertise that we didn't have and that was on the board. Uh, uh, when we were looking for space, uh, one of our trustees was Michael Eisner, who was then head of the Disney company. And I knew they must have someone who just scouted locations all the time and would know about real estate. And I said, uh, Michael, could you ask him to give me a call and uh, help me find some property? And he ended up finding this 170, a, a huge uh, Lockheed aircraft factory that was not being used any longer. That was only about 10 miles from campus and uh, produced 175,000 square feet of space. I mean, it, so I think it, it I, I really learned to draw on and accept the fact that there were things the trustees knew that I just didn't know uh, and that they were they would be they actually were happier sharing it. They were everybody wants to be valued for who they are, not just for supporting you. Um, and suddenly they could <laughs> they could really give who they really were. Yeah. There, you know, there was one thing I, I heard you talk about. It's sort of the yin and the yang of this. You, I believe you had just built back and there was a student in, in his senior installation piece. He wanted to cut a hole in the, in the ceiling or the, or the wall or something. And you said, we just built that wall. What, what can you tell me that story that made me think of that right now? Yeah, we, we had had to rebuild all our gallery spaces and this student thought, for the, which was gonna be the first show when the new galleries opened, that he wanted the gallery door to be locked and a peephole cut in the wall of the gallery just above eye level. So you had to stand on tippy toe to actually see the art inside. Um, and I was, I was complaining to uh, another wonderful trustee, a band named Peter Norton, um, and, he's, and he said, Steve, this is, this, running this school is not about the building, it's about the students. Uh, if that's what he needs to do, that's what you need to do. Um, and, uh, and he did it. I'll, I'll tell you quite a little off, uh, maybe a slightly off color story. Um, the very first board meeting after I got to CalArts, uh, I came in and 
the main gallery you had to walk through to get to the boardroom was full of eight foot tall photographs of vaginas. And what I was doing was being tested, was I gonna defend free speech? And um, people around me said, well, you gotta take this down. You're gonna offend the board. And, and I said, no, we can't take this down. This, is a, this person signed up for a gallery show and we don't get to say what they put in their gallery shows. And this is gallery space, even though you have to walk through it to get to the boardroom. Um, well, what happened is we were in such financial trouble then, the board walked past it without ever noticing what it was. <laughs> and the next meeting when I came and they tested me again with uh, actually wonderful big photographs of penises that were made to look like high rise developments from the way they were shot. Um, I asked the, the artist to, what, what, would, you, would you be willing to just stand here and talk to the trustees about um, why you, you know, why this? And he said, sure. Um, but again, we, have, we still had the same financial problems. They walked right past <laughs> wanting to get down to business. <laughs> That's a wonderful part of our, of our schools. It, it really is to just to see what the students do and where they take it. You know, let, let's shift over to that a little bit about arts education. Um, the value of an, of an education in the arts. Um, this is an interesting time we're living in. On the one hand, it's great to see that uh, value is placed on creativity. Uh, I don't know if you remember the study, it's been some years ago now, but IBM did a study several years ago where 250 CEOs stated that creativity was the greatest attribute a person would need to lead in the 21st century. Um, now, on the other hand, it's not necessarily a value that the creative process leads to something useful. It might lead to something profitable, but not necessarily useful. So, you know, I, I, I'm asking you now, why is art, the artistic process, and the artist important, particularly in this day and age? I, there's lots to say about that. I will say, <laughs> I say, I'll say two things. One, I think uh, Silicon Valley has taught us a quite shallow notion of creativity. Um, maybe not the first generation that invented things like the apple, but the various evolutions of social media were just an idea and a little bit of computer programming and we call it uh, think that they're thinking creatively. Um, I remember one of our jazz majors had become a serial entrepreneur. And I said, where'd you learn to do that? And he said, I'm a jazz musician. What we do is we improvise is that this isn't really creativity so much as this is just, we got theme, social media, and now we just have to do some turns on that theme and we can do it. So I, I, I'm always suspicious of the use of the word creative right now. Uh, although it's true, it's almost everything else in our, com our economy can be outsourced except for original thinking. Uh, and that seems like it's gonna increase. To me, the more profound reason is we, we are all in danger of settling for a very shallow notion of what it is to be a human being. In a way, human beings are getting reduced to how, how much can they earn? And what can they contribute to the economy? Um, and as artificial intelligence takes over more jobs, there's gonna be this increasing notion that, well, that's the same as human intelligence, which it's not, but it's, 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 gonna, it's gonna lead us to forget even more dimensions of what it is to be human, mm. uh, what it is to lead a decent life and contribute something of value. Um, to me, the arts are, they're part of the economy, but they're also one of the only sort of free creative spaces left in the economy where, I mean, there are individual private inventors who find a way, but by and large, everything is turned into the immediate financial return. Uh, and the arts are given space to explore and discover and create something genuinely new and to discover I hope in the process, kinds of human depth that without which I don't think our lives would be worth living. Um, to me, that, that is, that, that is the, that's become more important than it has been really any time in history because there's been no time in history when we've been so far from any deep sense of what it is to be a human being. Uh, 
Mm. Um, you're just hollowing it out and hollowing it out. Uh, people who think their political lives are what it means to be a human being. Uh, and uh, it shows in the ugliness of our society in so many ways and not just American society. Um, and then I do think to go back to the first phase, uh, there is something about having been taught to draw outside the lines. <laughs> I mean, to, to trust yourself. And in a way that's, that's part of what we're really teaching is how do you trust that you have something to contribute um, and believe in it enough to insist on it? And that is where the future of invention in our economy will come from. Um, so there is that, but to me, even more important is this, is this helping remain human beings. In, in a way, this goes back to, um, you know, that first program I started at CalArts, uh, the Community Arts Partnership with our, our um, I was not necessarily concerned with those kids becoming underserved kids in rotten schools, becoming artists. I was concerned with them discovering that they had human value mm -hmm. and they were making their art out of who they were. And I was absolutely believed that you discover that and you go on and you make a contribution in life. But we take that away from a lot of young people by the awful schooling we, we, we give them. Um, and I thought the arts, that, that was a, something you could do that really helped the society. If you're just joining us today, I'm speaking with Dr. Stephen Levine, former president of California Institute of the Arts. It's been very evident that you are committed to diversity and inclusion. And I think the, the CAP program, the Community Arts Partnership, certainly spoke to that. Uh, at CalArts, um, I, I believe what I, what I read was CalArts is 40 to 60 percent students of color, 20 percent international students, and a very high percentage of LGBTQ students. Um, and uh, you started the CAP program. You obviously uh, believed in diversity. You were going out into communities of socio uh, disadvantaged communities. Um, why was that important to you? But equally important, if not more important, how did that make the institution better because of that, that equity and inclusion? Well, <laughs> first, well, how to, how to go at this. Uh, I'll start at the end and say, it's, it transformed the institution in wonderful ways. Uh, at the end of the day, it brought us better students. Uh, uh, students who had a range of lived experience uh, that, um, enriched everything that happened at CalArts. It was interesting that often it was our African-American students who became our student leaders because they had had to fight to get to CalArts. They, they had overcome many of them bad schooling and fairly adverse economic conditions. Uh, and they had that, they, they'd already been selected for being exceptional people. They'd made it there. Um, and they would end up wanting to actually help the other students and so they became just fabulous uh, uh, stu student leaders. Uh, uh, let, me, let me go back to the, the other part of the question and I'll come back to that again. Um, underneath it all, I think what's driven me my whole life is thinking that if, if, there, if we can't hear what's really going on in our country and then in the world, that there's no way we can address the problems. There's no way we can make democracy a reality if we don't know the facts of life and that we need voices uh, representing everybody, uh, every card, every piece of the society. And, and we can't do every piece, but I mean, as much difference as you can, um, and they have, to, they have to learn to be articulate and be powerful so that the rest of the society can hear from them and help improve the whole. Um, maybe that was a kind of naive notion of democracy, but I still fundamentally believe it. I mean, what, what Black Lives Matter taught us this year uh, was facts of life. And they've been the facts for many years before this year but suddenly they were undeniable facts. Um, and, um, 
and they were they were present and as and if they're in front of us we have a chance maybe of addressing uh addressing it uh cal arts when i got there had been uh, no through no one's intent uh, a significantly white middle class institution i mean we had some we always had some exceptional um especially african-american students as it happens but i don't think we did anything to get them there we just got lucky that they chose us um but here we are in this city, which is why Los Angeles, which is wildly diverse, and we weren't do we weren't doing anything to try to identify um, the talent of the city and help it forward. Uh, so to me, it felt like just some version of elemental decency and the desire that there be justice in the world, and that we live a, again that we live a better life in which we we understand what our issues really are um and that they, that's part of what the arts at their best give us they uh part of part of it's reminding us that we're hu what humans is and that's part of reminding us what our situation really is um uh, one of the things that's striking to me is once you start down this line and we and we started cap when uh when we were my first year when we were in deep deficit first program we started, and I don't really know why I, I started there. I just felt it was important to do. And I remember there was a moment by the second year, it had become a $400,000 a year program. Uh, and because we were dealing with neighborhood institutions and with public schools with no money, um, we had to raise all the money for it. And I remember the student government came to me and to the board chair and said, you're raising our tuition by $400,000 and you're spending it not on us, but on uh, these other kids. Well, the truth was we were raising it from foundation, so we weren't spending their tuition on the other kids. <laughs> but my board chair, who was a wonderful man, Bob Eggleston, uh, said, I'm ashamed of you. It's too late in history to be talking the way you're talking. Uh, of course we should be doing this. And they couldn't believe that the, that the board chair, I mean, I couldn't say to them, I'm ashamed of them, um, but the board chair could say what he says. Um, the other thing is, when, when we started CAP, it was as much for our students as for the students they would teach in the neighborhoods. I wanted our students, you know, no, no matter what your background is, once you're in a college campus, you're leading a privileged life, uh, or mostly leading a privileged life. Uh, and I wanted our students to be in the presence of more of the real facts of life while they were being formed as artists. And this was a way for them not to be tourists in Watts or go visit Watts Towers, which is a wonderful thing to visit, but um, go just to look around. This was to have, have work you had to do. Um, uh, places, responsibility that took you to the, the areas. And, I thought, and I, I'm sure that that has made many of them better, richer artists. In fact, I know it has in the long run. And sometimes you can hear the difference between kids who participate in it, our students who participated in it, and those who didn't, that the ones who didn't still have naive notions about what goes on in the world. Uh, and the ones who did have, have, have learned in a deep way what the challenges are. Um, so then to go back to the second part of your question. So this brought us, um, I remember after one of the, one of the sets of riots in Los Angeles, I went to a show of, of professional artists who were responding uh, to the upheavals, um, and the work was it was good. And then I went to a show our students did, and it was so much better. And I, this is not to brag about Cal Art students; it's because these kids actually lived the problem. It was their it was their brothers and sisters who were getting shot. Uh, it was real. It was not just a, con a concept of what was what was happening in another neighborhood. It was the reality of their lives and they made things out of it. Um, and I, I think it's it, in just so many ways and, uh, and as it got broader and broader, um, we now have many, got eventually many Latino students at CalArts. That took longer than getting the African-American students, even though Los Angeles is largely a Latino city. Um, but again, depths of experience that, uh, that are, what the substance of the arts is about. Uh, and that's even if they're good, it, it's not just if you're a playwright or if you're a writer, 
it, if you're a violinist, it, 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 do you know why you're doing what you're doing and what it's what it's for, what it contributes to? Um, it's just immeasurably enriched what CalArts is. You, you know, in the book, um, you uh, speak about the fact that some of the richest universities in the country are the least likely to promote social mobility, and instead they can even reinforce class difference. That's what you're speaking to here. It, it's, a, it's, it's very difficult for, um, or at least it's perceived as, but really through the CAP program, you really are showing how, how a, a, a prestigious institution really can address it and it makes the institution better. And, you know, I never imagined when we started that we were recruiting kids for CalArts. I thought we were recruiting kids for community college because <laughs> I knew they didn't have two pennies to rub together. Um, but, in fact, once we were doing this, then Foundation said, well, if you're willing to do that, then we're willing to give you scholarship funds. And suddenly uh, there was a, another set of possibilities uh, came, came to be. Um, Ask me your question again, the way you just, oh, meritocracy. Yeah, I think real meritocracy would be a great thing, but it's not usually what's happening under the name meritocracy. Most meritocracy is rewarding people for the rewards they already had. Mm -hmm. So you go to a great prep school um, and then you get into Harvard because you had a great high school education and you had, you had the money to do that. And now you've got the money to go, go to Harvard. Uh, or, or I don't want to blame Harvard alone, but it, it, it's the basic pattern, though. That, um, and actually, music is one of the most is is a, is a particularly dangerous place for it because if you've had ten years of outstanding violin lessons before you ever got to apply to college, well, of course your chops are going to be better. It doesn't mean you're going to be a better musician in the long run, but you come in with skills that some. So we had to learn, and this was in a, in the end. I guess we learned it from CAP, but we got better at it. You had to actually not judge students just on things like auditions. You had to talk to them and say, "What? Do you, why are you doing this? What's in your mind? What? Do, why does this matter to you?" And start to get behind uh, the the lack of privilege that these students were bringing, uh, and hear what it is they were bringing. And often, what you heard again was so much richer and so much more. Um, I mean, positive always sounds like a dumb word, but so much more wanting to make a contribution to the society um, that they were clearly the students you wanted to have, that uh, they were people who were going to make a difference in the long run. Um, yeah, it's, I, they're just, I won't start telling stories of individual students, but um but you remember them so vividly, don't you? Oh yeah, <laughs> just um, people who who just glowed with purpose, just mm -hmm. glowed with decency. I mean, not everybody. I mean, we got some rotten kids like everybody. <laughs> um, but uh, and and I think it actually lifted everybody else's aspirations. Uh, if you if you have kids who are dealing with life and death issues. Um, then, then why am I just trying to draw a better cartoon? Uh, what am I, what am I doing within my animation? What am I, what am I doing? Everybody gets infected by the ambition in a way that says, yeah, I should make a difference too. That's, and that was really the message of CalArts. It's, it's a way what the failure and the title of the book is about. Um, we wanted kids to push themselves until they failed. And then to understand that failure is part of what happens. And then you go back and you do it again and you do it again uh, and gradually you rise above it. But if you're not failing, you're probably not ambitious enough in the first place for what you want to achieve. Um, and that that was a really important lesson because failure is painful. Um, well, that's exactly where, where I want to go. And you're talking about the experience for the, the students. Um, but in that environment, as it is here in Idlewild Arts, the students really push the faculty, right? Every year, they, they, they push the adults in the community. So this, this notion of failure, um, failure is what it's all about. How did you see it, both with the students, but also with the faculty? Well, 
fortunately, the the faculty, as it as it uh, is is chiefly working artists, and so they're living it themselves. Uh, they know what the frustration is of preparing for an exhibition and looking at the work and saying, uh, "I got to do. I got to put this up because the exhibition is now." But this is not what I thought. What I wanted to do. Uh, I got to go back and start again. I mean, sort of one of the founding stories at CalArts is John Baldessari being hired to teach painting. And just before he came to CalArts, he burnt all his paintings because he decided that it wasn't amounting to anything and shifted to manipulating phot photographic images and began the career that made him who he was. Um, so the, the faculty know it intimately. It's a challenge for them because when you've got a class, we don't have grades, but we have it's very close to the grades, high pass, low pass, those things. We wish we didn't have to have that. Um, but it's very hard to know how to evaluate something that that hasn't worked out um, mm -hmm. unless you really know the students and you know what went into them having it not work out. Um, it, it's why for, for every student we had, in, in addition to courses that they take, they would have mentors who they had ungraded relationship with. So there'd be someone who really understood from the inside mm -hmm. where they were going and could take away that element of you failed at this and uh, say, okay, this is, this is not it exactly. Um, I remember going to the, an end of the year um, critique uh, for the, the, anim the uh, graphic design students. And the critiques consisted of telling them, uh, talking with them about what they needed to go on working on now that they're graduating. <laughs> but what, what path they were on and what, what the challenges still were to get there. Um, and I just, oh, so wonderful. Um, so much better than this normal academic world of you write a paper and it's judged as an A, B, or C. I mean, sort of po pointless exercises in meeting a faculty member's expectations. Um, uh, the other is so is so obviously what we ought to be doing with our educational systems, um, and is what art schools can do. I mean, we we have a space that mathematics you either solve the problem or not. It's very hard. They're, they're trying to teach teachers now how to teach math in a way that's more conceptual and not just about can you solve mm -hmm. the problem or not. But there's a lot of fields where there is there are right answers, and it's the glory of the arts that there's no right answer. Um, that there are wrong answers, a lot of wrong answers, but there's no right answer. Uh, and so you keep pushing yourself to the next thing. Yes. And it, and it's sticking with this theme of the book, that failure, how did failure play a role in your leadership and success at CalArts? Well, in a way that's, I had always been afraid of failure because I had this early childhood experience of my mom having in one sense failed and being depressed um and a kind of fear that when i fail i would i would fail eventually too and i would end up like my mother having given up hope i wouldn't have the resilience to go on to the next thing and i always carried that away uh, around as a kind of a fear and every project i went into i carried this this fearfulness when of course fearfulness leads to caution and Caution leads to not fulfilling the possibilities. Um, uh, the, 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 that's why when I was said earlier that the, uh, the Northwood earthquake was like my graduation exercise, here I was confronted with the chance to really fail in a big way, <laughs> to put my school out of business by spending all this money that we didn't have. Um, and you just realized this is the world you take a step forward, you do what you got to do. Uh, some of this will turn out to be a mistake. Uh, but as long as we keep our eyes on where we're going, uh, this is what we have to do. And it, it just, it increased my courage in the world in, in, in a very nice way, I have to say. Um, I might have I might have said this to you already, but I always felt after the Northridge earthquake, it's, it's when St. Peter says, why should I let you in? Uh, through these pearly gates, I can say, I was at CalArts during the earthquake and I didn't run away. <laughs> uh, um, 
And I think that's that's in a way what you're trying to prepare. I mean, oh, the life of an actor, going to audition and have complete strangers just give you two minutes and say, you're not, in effect, you're not good enough. What they're really saying is you don't fit this part. And, but your experience is you're being, you're, your person is being rejected. You really have to prepare people to, or dancers where it's their bodies that are being judged. Uh, you really have to prepare people with the fact that um, they just have to ignore that, they have, that the real failure is, is not trying to achieve what you want to achieve um, and that there'll be setbacks. Um, I remember there was, there was um, we gave an honorary degree one year to a great Belgian woman filmmaker. And she said, you know, you can always make your art. She said, if I can't make it in 35 millimeter, I can make it in 16 millimeter. If I can't make it in 16 millimeter, I can make it in eight. If I can't make it in eight, I can do it in video. If I can't do it in video, I can do it in storyboards. So you can always make your art. Um, and what I told the students during the earthquake is that if you make it through this semester, this will be the most important semester of your life because you may not be the one where you learn most obviously. I mean, you're going to have trouble with not enough practice rooms, not enough pianos, all sorts of things. But this is the semester where you're going to learn uh, that you can grow and make things happen even without the tools and resources that you've come to expect to make that possible. And I didn't know if that was really the truth. I kept saying it because it seemed like a good line. Um, and years later, I'd have students come to me and say, you know, that was the critical semester. For, and I th I'm sure for many kids in all over America, this is going to turn out to be not the high school students who are going to have lost so much ground in their educations. That, uh, I mean, not, I don't mean high school, like an arts high school. I mean, the public school students mm -hmm. who've been just really deprived of a chance to learn. Um, but for, for many people, it's going to be where they learn, they could learn no matter what, uh, and that it was in them. And that's what we all have to learn, <laughs> that it's just in us. <laughs> the book is Stephen D. Levine, Failure is What It's All About, A Life Devoted to Leadership in the Arts. Stephen Levine, thank you so much for speaking with me today. Oh, it's really nice to talk to you. Really nice to see you. Thank you. Thank you. My guest today has been Stephen Levine, former president of California Institute of the Arts. Stephen and I spoke via Zoom on March 14th, 2021. We'll be right back with my next guest, Joseph Davis, a student in the music department at Idlewild Arts Academy. You're listening to One World, One Idlewild, the series. I'm Pamela Jordan. We'll be right back. At Idlewild Arts, we believe that art is the greatest teacher of humanity and that the practice of creativity hones each individual's desire and ability to craft global change. Please consider supporting the students of Idlewild Arts and visit idlewildarts giving to make a gift today. From Idlewild Arts Foundation in Idlewild, California, I'm Pamela Jordan with One World, One Idlewild, the series. Today, I'm speaking with Joe Davis, a jazz piano major and a songwriting minor at Idlewild Arts Academy. Joe Davis is an award-winning Jamaican-British musician and multi-instrumentalist. He was the first person in Jamaica to ever achieve a distinction on the Associated Board of the Royal Schools of Music Diploma exam. Joe plays a variety of instruments, including piano, bass, drums, vocals, djembe, and guitar. He attended Campion College in Kingston, Jamaica from grades 7 to 10 and now attends the Idlewild Arts Academy. He will attend Berklee College of Music as a contemporary writer and production major in the fall of 2021. Joe Davis, thank you so much for speaking with me today. I am so excited to bring your story to our audience. Thank you for having me. Really do appreciate it. So I understand that you were born in England and moved to Jamaica when you were 10 years old. And I just see you, you know, creating and playing all kinds of instruments. How did you first get introduced to music? How did it enter your life? Okay, so when I was around the age of five or six, my godmother bought me a keyboard. 
and it was only around 37 or so keys in length, but it was enough for me to realize I had a true passion for piano and music in general. And so when my parents saw that I would play like the theme tunes of television shows back in um, London where I was born and grew up, they decided to take me to the music part of my preparatory school back in the UK. And so they they took me to my musical director and he saw me play and he listened to me and like he saw the passion and so they started teaching me under the ABRSM syllabus and then I kind of just took that and ran with it um moved out to Jamaica did some grades under the syllabus and then I searched for some performing arts high schools in and around the world and eventually landed upon Idlewild and here I am okay I've got to go back with this so you were teaching yourself the theme songs from your favorite television shows. Is that what you were saying? Indeed, yes. I, I, did, I, I, I treated it like a hobby. <laughs> Why, so you were just playing by ear then? Yes, yes, precisely. Okay, and so then you, uh, you enrolled in the, association, the Associated Board of the Royal Schools of Music, and that's what you talked about, ABRSM. Um, Mm -hmm. And I wasn't familiar with that system. And I know you um, actually got quite a distinction in going through that system. Tell us a little bit about that system. You know, you studied in the United States. You've gone on to other ways of studying. What are the highlights from that uh, ABRSM system? Okay, so essentially it's a system of like teaching students different instruments, different ways to play music and so forth and so on. And they're based in London, England. And so I was taught classical piano because that's the, my, my foundation in music has been classical piano. And so I started learning under the ABRSM syllabus and essentially it's a graded system. So you take like an exam every year and then that boosts you up a grade. And so I skipped grade one and went to grade two and then achieved um, distinction. So there are three tiers of um, accolade that you can get there's a pass and then there's a merit and there's a distinction and I achieved distinction in grades two three four and five practical piano exam and then I achieved distinction in the grade five theory exam as well and then I went on to achieve a high merit in grades six seven and eight and then it ends at grade eight but then after that you can do like diplomas diplomas so I did my ARSM diploma in around 2018 and I achieved distinction in that and then I came out to Idlewild so I stopped with the ABRSM. Did I read somewhere that you uh, were the only person in Jamaica to to like receive a certain type of distinction? Indeed so for the ARSM diploma exam because that was the first year that they had introduced it into the ABRSM syllabus and so I achieved that diploma and I was the first person to achieve that in Jamaica and of that year of that first year there were only about five people who did it and I was the only person to achieve a distinction in that which kind of sets me as the first person in Jamaica to achieve distinction for that. One of the things that I think is so special about Idlewild Arts is that students get to engage with other passionate young artists from around the world and you have been for uh, for a year. We've returned, but you've been unable to return to the United States um, because of COVID. And I'm just wondering, what do you miss about being on campus with all the other young artists from around the world? So I am essentially a social monster. I, I get my energy from being around people and interacting with people. And so being online has been a great hassle, but it has definitely propelled me in terms of social media so I started an inst. well I had an Instagram page for a while but I started taking it a lot more serious when COVID started and I've just taken that and ran with it and I've gotten the attention of many like big people in the music industry and so forth and so on and so I mean I do miss my friends a lot, like a lot, especially since like I haven't been to Idlewild for over a year now. So it's been it's 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 been tough. But even though I do miss people, I still do get the knowledge that I need to know. And the teachers have found a way around it with like all virtual learning and Zoom and stuff like that. But they've been able to adapt their curriculum to fit what needs to be done so that I can get the knowledge that I need to excel musically virtually. 
So it's 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 not been the best situation, but the, we've we've definitely tried to find a way to make the most of it, and it has proven to be worth it. Well, you definitely are creating in in that space. Let's talk about a, a few things you've done. Uh, at the end of last the last school year, you were chosen to perform at the inaugural event hosted by the California State Society in honor of Vice President Kamala Harris. And I want to play your version of the Star Spangled Banner. Um, and then afterward, let's talk about how you produced this piece, really in a very short period of time. Let's listen. This is Joe Davis performing the Star Spangled Banner for the California State Society in honor of Vice President Kamala Harris. <laughs> dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and white stars through the perilous fight o'er the ramparts we were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there oh say The Star Spangled Banner. It it highlights highlights so many talents that you have. Tell tell us about how you produced it. it. You can even start at how you how you got the message to do it because that was even extraordinary. It was a fast turnaround. Indeed. So um, essentially, what had happened? I was just you know I was I think I was even in a class at this point. So I was eating. I, I was in a class and. I remember I had just answered a question. The teacher had asked me something. It was just like a regular Friday night. And then I get a, a, a Facebook message from somebody who attends Idlewild. And they said, yo, um, check your emails. So I did. And then I got an email from one of my private piano teachers. And he said that he wanted to hop on a Zoom call with me. So I said, okay, sure. So then we hopped on a Zoom call and he said, yo, um, I, ne I need you to kind of um think of something like patriotic and american because like the office of the vice um president um people are basically calling you to to do something and we kind of need it quick um so anything patriotic that you have please get it done and if possible within the next five hours and so i paused him and i said excuse me i i, I <laughs> it takes me more than a day to do most of the small arrangements that i do and i'm expected to do a arrangement of something of this magnitude in five hours and so he had suggested that I just turn it down, but I said, no, I'm going to give myself a challenge because I love a musical challenge. Like, that's one of my, I, I just absolutely love to take challenges. So um, so I decided to do that. And I, as a non-American citizen, or I, I'm not of American nationality, I decided to do the one American song that everybody knows, i.e. the National Anthem of America. And so, firstly, I, well, 
Firstly, I took the melody of the song. So I learned the melody and then I decided I was going to sit at the piano and construct some really, really nice chords underneath it with some cool harmonies. And like, you know, I just decided to make it sound as fun as I possibly could. And when I had the chords, I basically went into my closet because it was raining at the time as well. So I couldn't get clear audio quality. So I went into my closet, which is the most acoustically... Yes, my bedroom closet, (laughs) which is literally the most acoustically treated part of my whole room. I went in the closet and I recorded myself singing each layer from bass to tenor to alto to soprano. And I finished the audio recording in about three hours. And then I hopped into my video editing software and I took out my phone camera and I recorded myself against my green screen. And I took seven different recordings of myself singing the whole song the, the whole way through. And each, each recording was me singing a different part. And then I took those all into my video editing software and I spliced them all together, took out the green screen in the editing software and then plastered the American national, the American flag behind me. And I finished the video and I sent it off and it was good. And that took me just under five hours to do. So that took me right up until the deadline. And I was very, very satisfied with how it came out. And to this day, I think that's probably the best vocal arrangement that I think I've ever done. So I'm really, really proud of it. And I, I it was received well by the people at the event. And just to hear, like, for example, the one of the staff at Apple Music and all of these, like, big people in, like, the House of Congress and representatives and stuff, and just seeing all of these big dignitaries and so forth and so on recognize me and like the music that I made as like just this little kid growing up in London and Jamaica just coming out and doing this is just such a humbling and such a humbling experience and I'm really really grateful for it and it's uh it's an extraordinary example to those coming behind you those young kids who like you said you like a challenge and you you took it on um, it's just amazing, and I want to encourage our listeners to go to your your YouTube page and is that what they call it a page? Go to YouTube and and see Joe Davis, uh, see the video. It, it it really is quite quite astonishing. Um, I saw I saw your performance, um, which I believe also I saw it virtually, but I believe it was a virtual event. Um, for the Jamaica Jazz and Blues Festival. I think it was in March. And although I've seen you perform multiple times, I was blown away. And um, after the event, I was looking online, you know, trying to see what people are saying about you. And here's what I read in the Jamaica Observer. Um, It was prodigy Joe Davis who was most impressive. The youngster served warning that he is one to watch for the future. If, if one was taken by his diversity of musical styles within his set and smooth vocals, then his talent and multiple musical instruments was simply jaw-dropping. They go on to talk about you playing bass, that you played keyboards, bass, drums, you sang all without missing a beat. Um, tell me, how were you chosen for that? I didn't see many people your age. I mean, from what I saw, I didn't see anybody else your age. How were you chosen for that? And and what was it like to participate in that f- national festival? Um, well, thank you. Wonderful question. Um, so another artist that was chosen to perform at the event, his manager, we had a connection with his manager and she knew that I love doing what I do and she saw my social media posts and so on. And so she had referred me to the person who was organizing the event. And so they said, actually, he's, 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 he's kind of decent. So they called me and they said, hey, would you like to be a part of this? And I definitely, I said yes instantly because the jazz and blues festival is one that is definitely like it's recognized internationally and it's such a core part of the jamaican culture i just i couldn't turn it down and so they said okay we're going to give you a 15 to 20 minute set and you can do what you feel fit and so i decided i was going to do a jazz standard by the name of footprints i was going to do an original song by the name of opposite serpel I was going to rearrange a classic called Close to You by Karen Carpenter. And I was going to rearrange Superstition by Stevie Wonder. And I did all four of those and I did the tracks for them and I did them live. And I did it in a one-man band type of setting. So I had all of my instruments around me and I was just going crazy, running around them and just 
enjoying myself because there's nothing more to me that there, there's nothing that means more to me than just being surrounded by what I love to do and what I love to do is play instruments so I guess just having people watch it is a plus so I had fun with that and they liked it and people and they published it and people enjoyed it and so it was such a I'm really really grateful for that experience and it was so coincidental because I didn't even see it happening it was just by luck that she happened to think oh you know this kid he's 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 all right let's let's refer him so I was really really happy for that and it really did mean a lot to me and was a core defining moment of my the start of my musical career one of the things I admire about you so much is um, that you just continue to have a thirst for learning Uh, And everything you're talking about is I'll take on that challenge. I'll try that. I'll push myself. I'm going to go to this school. I'm going to study that program. So I know the listeners want to know you're graduating this year in in May. And what are your plans after this? What are you going off in the world to do? So I will be attending the Berklee College of Music in September. And that's in Boston, Massachusetts. Berklee has been my dream college for the past five years now. So being accepted and being able to go there is just a complete dream come true. Um, in the summer, I will be doing some other gigs like in and around Jamaica, and I'll be trying to find ways to further my career. I'll be definitely um, consistently uploading um, content to social media on Instagram and YouTube and to my website and so forth. And I'm just going to be trying to take my music to the next level and I'm sure that Berkeley will definitely be a big help um, where that's concerned and we'll just see where things go. So you can find me on Instagram at Joe Davis Music. That's the main place where I put all of my content for social media and all of the content on Instagram I also back up to my website joedavisarts.com and I also have a YouTube channel which is also Joe Davis Music and that's where I post more of the longer content that can't fit in a minute video on instagram and those are the three main places that you can reach me and if you'd like to hear some of my other original compositions then you can check me out on apple music and spotify both under the name joe davis you know i i usually just wrap it up after i ask that question but you're so talented and so driven um i i'm wondering if you could just speak a little bit more or speak specifically to how did Idlewild Arts really play a role in, 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 you know, Berkeley has been your dream school, but how did Idlewild Arts, you know, and I'm sure it's the teachers, play a role in you, you know, achieving this dream? Well, Idlewild has definitely been the perfect stepping stone to get me to my goal. So essentially, there are a few main reasons, one of which is the boarding aspect of Idlewild. So I, in Jamaica... I lived on the other side of the island to where my school was. So I was always having to be living fairly close to school and then I would travel back home and I would go to and forth every two weeks roughly. And so I was away from my family for two weeks and then I'd go and see them and come back and so on and so forth. So that was my first taste at boarding and I did that for four years. And then I came out to Idlewild and then that kind of broadened the two week stay away from my family and that widened it to a semester and so I mean I know that when I go to Berkeley everything's going to be a lot more independent but Idlewild in terms of boarding definitely gave me a good dip like I, I, I was able to put my foot in the water where independence was concerned and while it is a very very safe place I really really did like I felt extremely safe there and it was a very very protective place and I loved it there but it still allowed you to have a sense of maturity and it helped me mature a lot faster where that was concerned also the faculty there oh my gosh like some of the most experienced and talented people in their area and the fact that i was able to learn from some of the greatest people in that industry today is just absolutely incredible And they're able to share their knowledge and we're able to absorb it in a way that I know that not a lot of other people my age are able to. And especially in Jamaica, because I know that there is a thirst for um, a performing arts high school in Jamaica. And it's a project of mine I definitely want to embark on um, in the near future. And so I really, really am grateful for Idlewild for giving me that boost 
and that maturity boost and all of the resources that I needed to be able to take my music to the next level while I can now. And Berkeley's just going to take that and amplify it. And I'm just so incredibly grateful for this opportunity. Joe Davis, thank you so much for speaking with me today. I have thoroughly enjoyed our conversation. Thank you for having me. Really do appreciate it. My guest today was Joe Davis, a jazz piano major and a songwriting minor at Idlewild Arts Academy. I spoke with Joe from Jamaica via Zoom on April 16th, 2021. As we leave, we are listening to Joe's recently released single, Opposites Repel. You'd want to eat, I'd say a prayer. Thank you for listening to One World, One Idlewild, the series, a creation and production of Idlewild Arts Foundation. Executive produced by me, Pamela Jordan. Directed and produced by Rose Colella. Edited, engineered, and mastered by Justin Holmes. Graphic design by Mark Biley. Marketing and publicity by Wendy Winks. Marketing assistance by Rose Colella, Andrew Edwards, and Nick Ryan. Production and research assistance by Keith Miller. Creative consultation by Palencia Turner. Production support by Marianne Kent Stoll. Technical support by John Lawrence, Michael Quick, and Tom Wadbrook. Our theme song is Beaconing. It was composed and performed by the incomparable Marshall Hawkins. Pamela Jordan was appointed president of Idlewild Arts Foundation in 2014. Prior to this position, she held the distinction of being the first female and first African American head of school of the Chicago Academy for the Arts, where she held the position for 12 years. She currently serves on the boards of the California Association of Independent Schools the Association of Boarding Schools, and Art Schools Network, and is on the Global Education Advisory Council for Shanghai Hiwer Collegiate School Kanshan. One World, One Idlewild, the series, is a product of Idlewild Arts Foundation. Any use of materials, including reproduction, modification, distribution, or republication, without the prior written consent of Idlewild Arts Foundation, is strictly prohibited. But opposites rebel, opposites rebel, opposites rebel, opposites repel.